system, we have to overcome, we have to surmount two large obstacles. One is the users don't know it's our system. They don't know that they're using the GNU system. They think that they're using Linux and that the system was developed by Mr. Torvalds in 1991 and they know that he doesn't care about freedom for the users. So when they see the articles where we explain these ideas of freedom, they say to themselves, oh, this is another piece of propaganda from GNU. Why should I read that? After all, I'm a Linux user. And when they say Linux, they're actually talking about the GNU system. How ironic. If only they knew that they're users of the GNU system and that the system that they probably like exists because of these ideas, they might pay more attention to these ideas. We would have a chance to convince them and we would convince some of them. And that way, our movement for freedom would be stronger. But today, we have to overcome another obstacle, which is that they don't know the term free software either. Most of the people who talk about our software don't call it free or electoral. They have another term. They call it open source. That term was invented in 1998 by the people who didn't agree with us as a way of hiding our ideals. You see, during the 1990s, as the GNU plus Linux, GNU plus Linux system started to catch on among techies, many of them appreciated, for its, appreciated it for practical reasons. It was powerful, reliable, efficient, flexible, and you could run it cheaply. So they recommended it to others, but they didn't think or talk about freedom. So we, of course, tried to tell them about freedom. So in the 90s, there were two camps in our community, two political camps. There were those of us who valued freedom and social solidarity, and there was the other camp of people who only valued practical convenience, people like Torvalds. In 1998, that second group invented the term open source, which had not been used before. So they were able to choose which ideas to associate with it and which ideas to leave out. And they chose to leave out the entire ethical level of the issue. So they never say that there are freedoms that you deserve in using software. They don't say that proprietary software is an injustice. Instead, they say that they recommend a development method which is likely to result in software of higher quality. So the only values they appeal to are values of convenience. Higher quality software, that's a convenience value. And by focusing on that, they can direct people's attention far away from the issue of freedom, which for us is the central point. Well, even in 1998, there were already a number of businesses involved with free software. They developed free software or distributed free software or both. But most of them were also connected with proprietary software. And they did not want to teach the users to value freedom. Because if the users valued freedom, they would not be potential customers for proprietary software. So these businesses preferred to say open source. And of course, the politicians and the journalists mostly followed the businesses. So ever since then, when people hear about our work, usually they hear it described as, quote, open source, unquote, and they get entirely the wrong idea of what its purpose is and what the I ideas are that motivated it. So ever since then, 
in order to spread the free software ideas, we have to drive it home to people that we are not supporters of open source and we don't think the same thing that those people say. In fact, I've seen articles that describe me as the father of open source. I sent letters to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, then it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. I used that joke to introduce an explanation of the philosophical difference and thus inform people about the free software movement. And that's what I'm doing here today. That's what we have to do constantly because when people talk about our work, if they associate our work with the wrong ideas, they're not helping us at all. So we need your help to tell people these ideas of free software and freedom. People need to start to see how proprietary software restricts them and how it frequently is designed to put handcuffs on them. They have to recognize that this is an injustice, it's an evil system, and we have to put an end to it. And then they can join us and help. So, we're going to need you to help us do this. Now, you can do a lot of work to help. You can learn to give speeches like this one. That would be really useful. You can uh, get involved in free software activist organizations. That's also a very effective way to help. You can also help by writing free software. We need more of that too. But we actually have more people writing free software than we have campaigning for software freedom. So the place we need you most is at the campaigning level. Because it's very easy to lose your freedom. Life offers you lots of opportunities to throw away your freedom. Lots of people will offer you some kind of increased convenience if only you let him have certain kinds of power over you. And if you haven't learned to recognize why that's foolish, you might do it. So, if we want to establish freedom in a lasting way, it's not enough just to give people freedom. We have to teach people to want freedom as well. So if we could magically get free software tomorrow to do all the jobs that people want to do, we could give that out to people and then tomorrow they could all have freedom. But would they still have freedom in five years? Not necessarily. Because if they didn't appreciate the freedom that they would have, they might accept an offer to gain some convenience by giving up their freedom again. And we can see how easy this is by looking at our own community's history. Several times in the free software community, among the users of the GNU slash Linux system, we had freedom and then most of us lost it because our community did not pay attention. In 1992, when Linux was combined with the almost complete GNU system, it made the GNU slash Linux system, and you could get a PC and install the system, but it wasn't easy. You had to be an expert then. So people started making it easier. They made <coughs> distributions of GNU slash Linux designed to make it easier to install. And so a few years later, there were several distributions competing. And the developers of one of the distributions had a bright idea for how to gain more popularity. They could add some non-free programs to their distribution and present those to the users as a bonus, saying, use our distribution, look at what you get. Presenting this no these non-free programs that would take away the user's freedom as if they were an advantage rather than a threat. 
And it worked because most of the users didn't appreciate freedom either. So they chose this distribution, more of them did. And then the developers of other distributions looked at that and said, uh-oh, they have an advantage. We have to get rid of their advantage, so we have to put in the same non-free programs or similar ones in our distribution too. And so over a few years, all the distributions put in non-free software. And the result was, 10 years ago, when people asked me, where can I get a copy of this system? I had to say, I'm sorry, I don't know any place I can recommend to you because all of the distributions, and by then there were maybe a hundred distributions, all the distributions contain non-free software, so I can't recommend them. I'm happy, so in effect we had reached freedom and we had fallen back and lost it because we didn't care enough, most of us, to keep it. Well, I'm happy to say that today there are completely free distributions of GNU slash Linux. For instance, there is Ututo, U-T-U-T-O. And there is BLAG, which stands for BLAG, Linux, and GNU. Another recursive acronym. And there is GNUsense. And there is Treescale. And there are a few others. The list of them is in gnu.org slash distros. But these are not the well-known distros. These are not the ones you've probably heard of. Because the well-known popular distros continue to contain non-free software. So we have begun to recover the freedom we let go of. But just begun. We have a long way to go to reach the point where we can be confident that anyone who's installing the GNU slash Linux system is only installing free software. And then we lost our freedom in other ways. For instance, today the source code of Linux is not entirely free software. If you look at Torvalds' version of Linux, you'll find in some of the quote, source files, unquote, large tables of numbers, up to 300,000 numbers in a table. And these tables are really executable programs dressed up as source code. But the real source code for those programs is not available, which means they are not free software. You can't make a table of numbers into source code just by uh, including it in a source file and calling it a, a vector of numbers. <clears throat> in addition, many of these tables explicitly carry non-free licenses. So, what can we do? We have to maintain our own version of Linux, which is free. It's called Linux Libre which it means free Linux in Spanish. And what we do is we delete those non-free blobs. Because if you want a completely free version of GNU slash Linux, in particular you need your copy of Linux to be completely free software also. So, these are two examples, but there are others. It's very easy to lose your freedom if you don't appreciate it. So, please help us stand up for the idea of free software and freedom. Help educate others. Nowadays, there's a new way to lose control of your computing. It's called software as a service. With software as a service, instead of doing your computing on your data in your own computer, you send the data to someone else's server, and the, your computing is done by, there by software, well, you don't know what software, and then it sends you back the results. Or it may act for you directly. 
based on those results. But the point is, it's done some computing based on the data you sent. And you don't control that computing because it's being done in somebody else's server. So software as a service is equivalent to proprietary software in that both of them take away your control of your computing. Now, some proprietary programs have a malicious feature called spyware, where they send data about the use of the machine to someone else, the developer or someone related to the developer. This requires explicit code to send out messages with the information. But with software as a service, the same result follows automatically from the nature of the, of the scheme. Because the users have to send their data to the server, so the server has that data. And what they'll do with that data afterwards, the users have no way of knowing. Some proprietary programs have a back door that allows the developer to forcibly install changes in that software. With software as a service, the equivalent result is always true because the server operator can change the software on the server at any time. And that changes the way the user's computing is being done. So software as a service is equivalent to a proprietary program with spyware and a dangerous backdoor. You, for your freedom's sake, you must reject that proprietary software and you must reject software as a service also. So if somebody's website offers to do your computing for you, you have to say no. Now, this is a small minority of websites. Most web services are not software as a service because what they're doing is not your own computing. It's either making data available to you or it's doing publication for you or communication with you. And those are different kinds of activities. You couldn't do them within your own computer. You can't communicate with me just by staying within your own computer because I would never get it. Uh, communication can't be done purely within your own computer at all. So it's a different kind of issue. But when it comes to doing your computing, there you need to reject the offer to let somebody else's server do it for you. <clears throat> To close, I would like to mention a couple of other specific topics. One is free software and employment. Sometimes our adversaries try to suggest that if the world switches to free software, we would have a disaster for employment. That's ridiculous. Look at the employment in the IT sector. Paid programming software development is a small fraction of that. Most of it is people being paid to use software. Free software just helps that. But what about the paid programming? A small fraction of that is development of proprietary software products. The rest is development of custom software. Custom software means the program is being written for a particular client and that client is paying to get it written. If the world moves to free software, if the users all understand they should demand freedom, and they do, then this, these jobs developing proprietary software, they will disappear. But these jobs in custom software, they will stay basically the same. Because the same clients are still going to have to pay the same people to write this software. And these jobs will be the same or they might increase. Meanwhile, free software generates employment, programming employment. You see, that's because, because users can pay people to adapt and extend free software. 
They can't do that with proprietary software. If you wanted to pay somebody to adapt and extend Windows or Mac OS or, the, or some other proprietary program you've heard of for your needs, you can't because, I mean, there could be a programmer who's capable of doing the job, but he can't have the source code, so he can't do the job. But with free software, you can pay the programmer of your choice to do that kind of work. It's like, you know, changing your house. If you don't know how to do it yourself, there are lots of plumbers and carpenters who could do it for you, and they'd be happy to do that work for you. And, in fact, that's a lot of employment. So what we see is, a certain small fraction of the IT sector employment would disappear, and there'd be some new employment. Well, whether this means more employment or less, I don't know. But what's clear is, the worst possible case is not very bad. It's a small loss. It can't be worse than that. So there's nothing to fear. That's the crucial point. The second specific topic is free software and education. Schools and the whole educational system must teach free software and only free software. There are four reasons for this. The most superficial one is to save money. Even in the richest countries, the schools don't have enough money. They must not spend some of their limited budget paying for permission to run non-free software. This is a benefit that comes about from the fact that once a school has a copy of a free program, it's free to install as copies in as many of its computers as it wishes and doesn't have to get permission to do this. And a whole school system can do this too because this is part of the four freedoms. So people can appreciate this benefit even without understanding what free software really means. But precisely for that reason, we must not make the mistake of focusing too much on this one superficial reason. We need to educate people to recognize the importance of freedom. And besides, there are some proprietary software companies that will eliminate this reason by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. And why do they do this? They are trying to use the schools as instruments to impose dependence on their product on all of society. Here's how their plan works. They deliver these gratis copies to the school, the school teaches the students to use them, and the students develop a dependence on the product. Then they graduate with the dependence. And after they graduate, the same developer is not going to offer them gratis copies. And they go to work in companies. The developer is not going to offer them, to offer these companies gratis copies either. So the idea is the school directs the students down the path of permanent dependence, and they pull the rest of society with them. <coughs> It's just like offering the school gratis doses of addictive drugs, saying, inject these into your students to make them dependent. The first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you have to pay. The school would reject these drugs, and it should reject the proprietary software too, because the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free society. And in computing, the only way to do that is to teach people to be free software users. Teaching the use of proprietary software is spreading dependence, and that's the opposite of the mission of the school. 
But there's a deeper motive for the education of the best programmers. You see, some people are natural born programmers and at the age of 10 to 13 years, they're fascinated and they want to learn everything about the system and the computer and how they do this. But when a youth asks the teacher, how does this program do this? If it's proprietary, the teacher can only respond, I'm sorry, we can't find out, it's a secret. And thus, education cannot begin. Proprietary software is knowledge withheld. It's the enemy of the spirit of education and it should never be tolerated in any school. But if the program is free, the teacher can explain what he knows and then say, here's the source code of this program. Read it and you'll understand everything. And that youth will read it because that youth yearns to understand everything. And then if the teacher can say, if you encounter any point you can't figure out, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And this gives our natural born programmer the chance to learn something very important. That code is not clear, so don't write it that way. And this is a very important lesson. You see, you don't have to teach these people to program because for them it's obvious. But programming well is something else. The way you learn to write good, clear code is by seeing lots of examples of code that isn't clear and seeing why it isn't clear and learning not to write it that way. You have to read lots of code and write lots of code. Only free software offers the opportunity to read lots of code of programs that we really use. And then you have to write lots of code. How do you learn to write code for a large program? You have to start small, which means writing small changes, small additions of code to a large program. You don't learn anything about the difficulties of large programs by writing small programs, because the challenges of large programs don't even begin to appear in small programs. So the only way you can start small is to take an existing large program and write a change for it. And only free software gives you the chance to do that. That's how I learned. I worked at MIT in this lab where we had a free software community. We had a free operating system and my job was to make it better. So I had to read a piece of an existing large free program and then write some changes for it. And then read some of it another free program and write changes for it. And that's what most of the work is, writing changes to existing programs. Starting a new program is rare. Improving existing ones is most of the work. So if we want to teach those people who have the appropriate talent to be really good programmers, we need to give them the chance to practice. And free software offers it, proprietary software doesn't. I had an opportunity in the 1970s that was nearly unique. But today, any school can offer this opportunity if it is a free software school. But there's an even deeper reason, and that is for the sake of moral education. Education and citizenship. Because schools have to teach not just facts and skills, but above all, the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping other people. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class including the source code, in case someone would like to learn. Because this is a place where we share our knowledge. Every class, every school must have this rule. But the school, in order to set a good example, has to follow its own rule. It has to bring only free software to class and bring it with the source code. If you are connected with the school in any fashion, then it's your duty to campaign to move that school to free software, to remove and eliminate the proprietary software there. 
So now, I'd like to mention a few websites where you can get more information. There is GNU.org, the website of the GNU Project and the Free Software Movement. There is also FSF.org, the website of the Free Software Foundation, which campaigns for free software. And on that site, you can find various resources that are helpful to using free software. You can also find our political campaigns. For instance, we started a campaign of protests against digital restrictions management called defectivebydesign.org. If you go to that site, you can sign up and we'll inform you about our protests. Most of the protests are done through the net, so you can participate easily from anywhere in the world. Please sign up and participate in our protests because the mission is to show some large companies that if they design products to attack our freedom, they will be hated. And there's also the Free Software Foundation Europe, fsfe.org, which also needs your help. And you can, uh, you can join the Free Software Foundation that's another thing you can do at fsf.org, but you can also join here if you wish, paying cash, because you have to pay your dues. So if you wish to join here, come talk to me, but you can also do it through the site using e-commerce. So now I would like to present my other identity. <laughs> I am Saint Ignatius. <laughs> I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as a text editor that I wrote, an extensible text editor, which became a way of life for many users because it was extended so much that they could do all their computing inside Emacs. And then it became a religion with the launch of the newsgroup alt.religion.emacs, <laughs> which you might be amused to visit. Today in the Church of Emacs, we have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs. And we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we <laughs> worship an editor. <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the Confession of the Faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> If you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony, the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant lines from the system source code. <laughs> we also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs. The Virgin of Emacs is anyone who has not yet learned to use Emacs. <laughs> and According to the Church of Emacs, offering the virgin the chance to lose Emacs virginity is considered a blessed act. There is also the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with 
other churches I won't mention. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary operating systems have possessed computers under your control or set up for your regular use and then install a wholly free operating system <laughs> and then only install and use free software with and on the system. If you make that vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you too will have the right to wear a halo. <laughs> if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People have sometimes asked whether in the Church of Emacs it is considered a sin to use the other editor, VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and uh, no, my Halo is not an old computer disk, but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. <laughs> so thank you very much.